church. Let's rise up. We'll read the Bible pledge together. If you have your Bibles with you, say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I, I, I have what it says I have. You can say it together. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the word of God. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Kindly remain standing for the scriptures of today. It's taken from the book of John, chapter 21, verses 18 to 25. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Then Peter, turning around, and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren, that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. Father, we just want to thank you for this word. We ask, Lord, that you will give us a fresh revelation of what you need to speak to our hearts through these scripts through these scriptures, and I ask, Lord, that you will anoint my mouth as I speak. Kindly be seated. We are talking about you must follow me. Let's get a recap of what's happened just before we get into chapter 21. In Matthew 26, 31 to 35, Jesus has predicted that Peter will deny him. After that, in Luke 22, 61 to 62, we see the Lord turned. This is after the denial. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him before the rooster crows. Today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. We all know that Peter always acted hastily and later regretted it. He stepped out of the boat and ended up being in the water. Told Jesus he should not go to the cross only to have Jesus say to him, get behind me, Satan. But the denial of Jesus weighed heavily on his heart. I wonder how many times this would have been going on in his mind. What did I do? All of us, we do something sometimes that we regret, especially if that is regarding our relationships or in our Christian lives. So Peter was looking for freedom from this guilt that he felt about denying Jesus on the night of his arrest. Verses 1 to 3 of John chapter 21 tells us that Peter went back to his former profession of fishing. No doubt he was overjoyed to hear that Jesus was resurrected. But how could he ever take part in the ministry of Jesus when he knew that he had denied him? Peter had been wishing that he would have a second chance maybe that he could rectify what he had done wrong. I'm sure many of us, if we are asked, 
Would you want to have a second chance where you goofed it? We also would say yes. So he was here, he was th wishing that everything would change. Peter would not find freedom though till he confessed his sin and repented of it. There can be no forgiveness of sin without confession and without repentance. Sometimes we have to go back to the root of where it started to ask and see where we went wrong so that we can receive forgiveness from Christ and value again to where we were in our lives. In John chapter 21, 15 to 17, we see that Peter is reinstated as a disciple. But the three things that he had to do was first, give up the spirit of competition, two, repent of past sins and failure, and three, understand the cost of discipleship. We all know that Peter left his beloved sea, the Sea of Galilee, his nets, his fish, his everything that was dear to him. And when Jesus called him, he went. Peter left something more important at this stage, the spirit of competition. He and Andrew had been business partners with the sons of Zebedee, John and James. Their John and James may have been doing better than Peter and Andrew, but Peter knew all about fishing. Plus, he had good physique. We are told that he pulled the net containing 153 fish alone. Imagine that. He was really strong. And Jesus asked Peter now to give up that competitive nature on this seashore. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to the disciples on a beach. And he's made a charcoal fire and he's cooked a breakfast. Would you like to have a breakfast with Jesus? Well, he's always waiting to have breakfast. Maybe he doesn't have the cooked fish, but he can provide for whatever you need. So he is reminded when he gets the smell of smoke, he is reminded of an awful night not long ago as he warmed himself at the charcoal fire when he denied Jesus. Twice it's mentioned about the fire. Once in John 1818, the time when he denied Jesus, and now here in chapter 21, verse 9, when Jesus is cooking a breakfast for them on the fire. The first fire was when he denied Jesus. The second fire that's mentioned is the time when Jesus restores him back to where he was. Nothing with Jesus happens by coincidence. After the meal, Lord asked Peter three times, do you love me? The first time, do you love me more than these? Jesus always wants to know your heart. Peter had been sure he loved the Lord more than the rest of them put together. But now he had to humbly admit that it was not so. He denied his master three times. If we are to shepherd the Lord's sheep, then there is no room for spirit of competition. We must all work together to get hold of the sheep because Jesus was seeking each and every one who is lost and he expects us to do the same. We need to cooperate to work together to bring the sheep in to the fold. Do you need to give your competitive nature to Jesus today? Number two, repent of past sins and failures. Can you imagine when he was asked three times, do you love me? It could have pierced his heart. Why is Jesus asking me this three times? But he remember, he even denied Jesus three times. And he is remembering that he has been a failure recently. But the Lord shows us, you may have many failures. You may say, I'm no good at all. But I tell you, God 
Jesus came to this earth to seek those who say, I am a failure. He is not here to get the prime. If you are well, you don't need a doctor. But when you are not well, when you are sick spiritually, you need Dr. Jesus. And he is always available 24-7. So we see that loving and serving God is a learned art. Sometimes many failures on the way. Peter could have told the Lord, go away from me. I am a sinner. I'm no good to serve you. He could have killed himself like Judas. Instead, Peter allowed Jesus to forgive him, to cleanse him of his past sins, and fill him with the Holy Spirit so that he could serve the Lord powerfully. I tell you, whichever stage you are today, you can serve the Lord if you are only willing to say, Lord, I have regret of my past. I want to move forward. Help me. He is there to help you. Are you willing to let go of your past sins and failures? Next is understand the cost of discipleship. Peter had served Jesus for three and a half years nearly. He had given Jesus the benefit of his strong body, personality, time, energy, enthusiasm. He had not charged Jesus for anything for his services, nor demanded special treatment when they traveled together. In his opinion, he had given everything of himself. He had given something to Jesus. But after the cross, he understood that he had nothing, and especially after his failure, he knew that he had nothing to offer to Jesus. He came to realize discipleship is not giving something for nothing. Discipleship is giving nothing for something. Now Peter had nothing to give but his failure. And Jesus forgave him and said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. So if you've messed up your life, how incredible it will be when you go to Jesus and he tells you he's going to give you a chance again to serve him. I'm sure all of us want to serve Jesus. We all didn't land up in Kuwait only to make money. We are here also to serve Jesus. Not here only to hear the word and go home. It's also to go and seek the lost. All of us need to have that on our heart. So, we, when we approach God and say, Lord, forgive me, I have nothing else to give you. I am a sinner. He takes you just like he took Peter. He forgives you and gives you a chance again to serve him. Are you willing to give up and understand the cost of discipleship? You have nothing to give him. All that he has he already owns everything. He doesn't need anything from us. But when we come to him and say, I lay down at your feet whatever I am. Use me, Lord. He can use you. So are you willing to give up everything and understand that you have nothing to offer him, but he has something special to offer you if you will just come to him and say, Lord, take me, use me. Mold me. So we see Peter repented and now Jesus is asking him to commit his life to him. When you have repented, when you have done with, you ask for forgiveness, the Lord is asking you, will you commit your life to me? His identity changed after that. His occupation changed from fisherman to fishers of men. His identity changed from impetuous to a rock. His relationship changed to Jesus. He was forgiven. And finally, he understood the significance of Jesus' words about his death and his resurrection. The calling for Peter in following the Lord Jesus was to feed his sheep and his lamb. The main business of all believers is to seek and serve God. When you are, your heart 
has a change, you have a change of heart. You'll want to know more about Jesus. You'll want to worship him more. You'll want to obey. You'll want to trust him. You need to trust Jesus and know that if you have him, you have it all. You don't need anything more. Jesus is all you need. How would you respond if Jesus asked you today, do you truly love me? Do you really love me? Are you willing to commit your life to me? We continue now in today's scripture, verse 18. A prediction is made of Peter's death by crucifixion. Jesus makes a solemn and authoritative statement. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, telling the type of death Peter would one day experience. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and they will lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus tells Peter that at the end of his life, he will be laying down his life for his savior, not defending it like he did in the garden of Gethsemane with a sword, but lovingly he would be sacrificing his life. Tradition has it that Peter was crucified for the faith upside down. He did not feel worthy of dying as the Lord did. Jesus' command to follow me began at the start of his ministry, and he said it throughout his ministry, and he continues to say it today, follow me. Now as he's preparing to ascend to the Father, he gives the command to continue after, even after he is gone. Maybe because the years have gone, so many years have gone, passed, we think that that command is not for us. But I tell you, Jesus tells us today, follow me. He gave us this command 23 times in the gospel. For Peter, following Jesus as a shepherd was more than teaching. It would involve pain, suffering, and ultimately execution. Jesus issues the same call to every disciple. You follow me. And when he says that, he means total commitment. If you love Jesus, you know, there are only two commands. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. How can you love God with all your strength and your mind and your heart is by serving him faithfully. You cannot love a God you cannot see when you don't love people whom you can see. So two things only, love the Lord and love people. So the Lord, we know, when we say Lord now, we know that the way to God is through his son, Jesus Christ. He is the beginning and the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the great I Am. Revelations 14.4 says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. The Lamb of God leads all those who will follow him. Despite what Peter's future looked like, Jesus told him, follow me. We may think our future, we don't know what it is, but today the call still stands. Jesus says, follow me. And if you know that God is in control of our lives, of everything, you will confidently put your life in his hand and follow him. Peter, seeing him afterwards, Peter seeing John, says, but Lord, what about this man? Peter saw he was, you know, that he was impulsive, full of excitement, questions, comments. He quickly asked, what about John? This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, who is going to betray you? Well, the name of John is not mentioned there, but we understand it because the speaker speaks in a way that identifies him as the author. 
Will he die the same way as I will? That's what Peter wanted to know. Why did Peter want to know that? First, because he was a disciple who was following Jesus along with them. Second, he would have been wanting to know, I have messed it up. I denied Jesus. Is my death going to be worse than this guy? How is it going to be? All of us want to know that, right? We are more interested about somebody else than about us. But Jesus tells, Jesus' answer is more important. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. You run your race. You look on to Jesus. Have you seen people running a race? When they look behind to see where's the next person following them, they lose time. When you're running your race, just look at the finish line. Run your race with all your strength, with all your mind, with all your dedication, because you want to win the race. Don't look at someone else. Each of us have our own race to run. So this is what Jesus tells him. Jesus did not mean that John would not die. Jesus is saying, Peter, when it comes to God's calling, God's appointment, death, or any other thing, those things are God's business, not yours. If John is commissioned to serve God, and if he is going to die before or later, that also is according to God's good pleasure. God knows the time for each one of us when our race finishes. We cannot be worried about other people's race because we have plenty on our plate itself. We got to see how we can manage best so that when we stand before God, God's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So Jesus says, what is that to you? does not destroy Christian accountability. Jesus was not saying we are not accountable to others. We shouldn't care about others in the body of Christ. Jesus was not negating the nature and purpose of the church to love, care, and encourage, correct one another, because we see that Peter, later on in his ministry, he instructs, he educates, and plants local churches. Jesus was not endorsing isolation or individualism within the church, but saying that some things concerning believers is God's concern and not everyone's concern. We know that Peter was not crucified immediately. He continued to minister for nearly 30 years. But Peter died to self on that day when Jesus restored him. And he died well in advance to self before he died on the cross. All followers of Jesus are called to do the same. Jesus said to Peter, what is that to you? You follow me. Are we willing to follow Jesus? We should be. The Gospel of John actually closes in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus made it clear that he indeed was God in the flesh, that forgiveness and salvation were by faith in his works alone. He was who he claimed to be, and his resurrection sealed that claim. John is writing in his gospel to show that Jesus was the son of God. He clearly and systematically pre presented the evidence of Jesus' claim. Now when you sit in a court, if the evidence is given to you, you've got to make a decision whether it is against the person or it is for the person. And John has placed everything in his gospel. You are the jury. And once you understand that, you got to either accept Jesus or say, he's not the son of God. I won't believe. The decision is yours. I tell you, read John's gospel and believe. You come across a new believer, tell them to read the gospel of John first 
because in that gospel it clearly showed that Jesus is the son of God and if he is the son of God we are wanting everyone to know Jesus because the only way to the father is through his son Jesus Christ so we know in verse 24 the epilogue of chapter 21 and verses 24 and 25 says this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down we know that this testimony is true john reveals his authorship of the gospel and authenticates his eyewitness account as true verse 24 reveals an answer to the peter's question in verse 21 what about him john revealing himself as the author we know that john god uses him to bear witness to the gospel john's witness is added to the list of people who have testified to having seen jesus after his resurrection so we know that he is the only savior the only lord jesus christ who we should follow early church history reports that john spent several years as an exile on the island of patmos and then he returned to ephesus where he died as an old man near the end of the first century and finally john closes with a hyperbole in verse 25 jesus did many other things as well if every one of them were written down i suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written jesus uh, john includes only seven miracles of jesus but we know that jesus did many things when he was here on the earth we have to be eternally grateful for whatever is revealed to us in the word of god because of that we know that jesus is the son of god and the only way to heaven the only way to eternal life and the only way you can get salvation because god gave us clarity in his word we know that we are in the right place and know jesus thank god that you been called by name that you are a christian so many who do not know the lord as yet so many perishing daily but you have the opportunity you know jesus so think about the lost one we are here to seek and save the lost 1 john 1920 identifies john's closing of the letter we know that we are children of god we know you know and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one we know also that the son of god has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true by being in his son jesus christ he is the true god and eternal life amen jesus is issuing today a personal let call to you saying follow me because jesus is in that business of restoring he restored peter wants to restore us as well so don't beat up yourself about your past don't get stuck in guilt don't feel that you are undeserved you you are not qualified jesus calls the unqualified and you're beyond forgiveness restoration is available run to jesus soon after the meal jesus says jesus didn't go to peter and say why did you deny me didn't i tell you in advance i was going to die couldn't you have tried a little harder couldn't you you disappointed me he did not add to his guilt instead she was jesus says simon son of john do you truly love me more than these you know when is the first time he is called that he is called simon son of john in john chapter 142 when jesus calls him the first time into ministry after that he is only known as simon peter or peter but here again jesus says simon son of john so jesus brings him to the place to start all over again where he goofed it so i tell you today if you goofed it 
Ask the Lord to show you where it happened so that you can go back and repent and get back into a fellowship with him. So he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? So the adventure had started when Jesus called him the first time. And then he has an important role to play in the church. We know that after the Holy Spirit ascended on them in the upper room, we know that this fisherman gave his first powerful speech. He can use you. Are you willing to be used? So, Jesus wants to ask you today, do you want to make a 100% commitment? The point is, you may say, I'm not enough. I don't qualify. But Jesus is all we need. If you are willing to offer yourself honestly, honestly, okay? Honestly, when you say, Lord, use me. I made a mess till yesterday. But today, I want to give my 100% to you. If that's you, believe me, if you say, Lord, use me, he will. He will use you. So, are you willing to make a 100% commitment to Jesus? Let's rise up. I'll pray for you before we close. Let's rise up, all of us. Please stand. Lord, today I come into your presence. Lord, I am not worthy. Lord, I have messed up many times. But Lord, today I come into your presence. I know that you are a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Lord, I messed it up so far. But I want to say today, Lord, that I give it all in your hands. I have nothing to offer you. But I know, Lord, that when I come with a sincere heart, I confess my mistake and repent that you are a God who can give us second chances and use us powerfully. In whatever way, Lord, you have for each one of us, I ask, Lord, that you will show each one of us in what way you want to use us. We just want to say honestly, like Peter, he did not want to make a commitment, but you question him lovingly, and thereby you could use him mightily. We ask, Lord, that he will use each one of us. We lay aside everything, all our pride, all our ego, whatever, is coming in between our relationship with you and say, Lord, have your way. Use us. We want to follow you. 100%. Lord, if it is 50, 60, we are stuck there. We ask, Lord, that you will make it 100% as we continue to walk with you faithfully. Lord, we just ask that you will use us mightily for your glory. In Jesus' mighty and matchless name we pray. Amen.